Thank you for joining our NFIB webinar. We're going to bring you the latest details of Governor Tom Wolf's budget, and you're going to hear about a proposal he has to jack up the minimum wage, a plan by the governor to double the salary threshold of employees who get overtime. And if you have any questions throughout, you can type them in. To bring you all this, we have Rebecca Euler online, and she is our NFIB Pennsylvania Legislative Director who's over at the State House every day and has a great handle on this topic. Okay, Rebecca, let's see what you have. Thank you, Suzanne. So the governor proposed his budget about a week and a half, two weeks ago in his annual budget address. And uh, today we're going to walk through what his proposals were. Um, I wanted to start um, briefly with a recap of last year's budget. Uh, it took about four months after the deadline, the the June 30th deadline to actually resolve the budget last year. So I thought it would be helpful to sort of discuss where we left that off. Um, the, it didn't help last year that the budget deficit started um, with about $1 billion um, in in the red from the previous year. Last year, the governor proposed tax increases, a severance tax and an expanded sales tax. Um, and there was a revenue package passed in, in July that the Senate agreed to, um, which increased uh, taxes, um, including a gross receipts tax on natural gas, electric and phone bills, and the severance tax that the governor asked for. NFIB opposed this package and fought it uh, pretty vigorously, um, especially the gross receipts tax on natural gas, which was a new tax of about of 5.7 percent. So, of course, in combination with the severance tax, that would have increased energy costs across the across the state um, pretty pretty um, severely. So, we opposed that um, with the help of members um, who came out in, in support of our efforts um, by testifying before committees, writing emails and letters to their state legislators. Um, so we did generate quite a bit of um, effort to, to oppose that, um, that package. And we were successful. Happily, uh, the House did not support that uh, packet, that revenue package that was passed in the Senate, um, and it it did not pass. That gross receipts tax was effectively killed. Um, and when the uh, budget was finally passed in October, um, it was not included. Um, so here are the details of the budget that actually passed last last year. And I'm not going to go into any detail, but suffice to say that it did depend quite a bit on borrowing and one-time one-time uh, revenue um, one-time revenue plans, one-time transfers. So I wanted to highlight briefly um, the first bullet under uh, the bullet there that says targeted tax increase and increases and enhanced tax collection procedures, um, non-resident withholding. Uh, there were a number of tax collection and enforcement ideas that were proposed by the Wolf administration, and this one unfortunately did make it into the final bill, so it is now law. Um, this one requires businesses who contract with out-of-state contractors to withhold the personal income tax on behalf of those out-of-state businesses and send it to the Department of Revenue. So it essentially is making businesses, Pennsylvania businesses, tax collection agencies for the state on behalf of those out-of-state businesses. So this one we opposed pretty vigorously, but unfortunately we lost that fight. Um, the other one I wanted to highlight quickly uh, was that shortened tax appeal period. This was part of the enforcement items that the uh, governor's um, administration proposed the tax appeal period was shortened from 90 to 60 days last year. So we're hoping that there aren't, um, you know, a whole slew of tax enforcement procedures that are proposed along with this year's budget. We're, we're going to be on the lookout for that. So um, I wanted to discuss briefly um, some of the um, some of the things I think that we've sort of learned from last year's um, budget experience. Uh, the first is that the legislative leader, leaders, um, having passed now two um, two budgets with uh, passing the spending plan without the revenue plan to pay for it um, two years in a row, they have vowed not to do that again. So we're hoping this year we get the revenue and the spending plans passed at the same time on time and we don't repeat the, the experience of last year. The other is uh, the so-called... Um, Restricted funds or this shadow budget, um, also called shadow budget, uh, some people are calling it. Um, there are about um, 218 um, funds in the state budget, which make up about 60% of total costs of the state budget, 
which are um, actual funds that are are restricted to being spent on certain items. In last year's budget, um, there was a lot of attention focused on these funds to see if those accounts, the revenue in those accounts were being um, raised and spent appropriately. So there's a lot of attention focused on them again, I think probably in this budget year to see if any of those funds could be um, spent for the, the general fund budget, um, if they're, they're being used appropriately. So I think there is some, um, continue to be some attention spent on the, the, the restricted funds. Also wanted to mention that there seems to be in some circles a lot more um, support for what's called the Taxpayer Protection Act. This would be a constitutional amendment that's been proposed. It actually has already passed in the House that would limit the growth of state spending to just um, a combination of the consumer price index and the rise of um, the increase in population in the state, a combination of those two items over the, over the course of a three-year period. So um, it has already passed the House and uh, We'll we'll likely um, get some attention again since the governor is proposing um, an increase this year, which would be larger than um, what would be allowed under the Taxpayer Protection Act. Wanted to mention there's a, a group of members in the House who last year started focusing beginning on those restricted accounts, but now they're focused on um, more other items like accountability and transparency and the cost drivers in in welfare and education that um, really drive our, our budgeting process. They're calling themselves the Common Sense Caucus in the House, and um, they're focused a lot on uh, on budget items like that, um, been holding some hearings and have some proposed legislation. So we'll be tracking some of the proposals that they have this year as well. And then I wanted to mention too that it does seem like revenue options are are limited. They they seem to be kind of limited. Last year there's not a lot of support for um, broad-based tax increases um, this year. So um, and as I said last year it was a lot of one-time uh, revenue transfers and and borrowing and it doesn't seem like that has changed much this year. So um, that that said, we can move ahead and talk about this year's budget. <laughs> so moving on to this year, um, the governor uh, is proposing a billion dollar increase over last year's budget. The total uh, budget is is thirty three point one eight billion dollars, and unlike previous budgets. He's not proposing a broad-based tax increase this year. The only tax he's proposing is the severance tax, which I think he's proposed every budget year, um, the severance tax on natural gas ex extraction, um, which would be in, exist in addition to the existing impact fee. Um, so the other items I wanted to mention, and we can talk more about the severance tax if anyone has any questions, but some of these other items I think might be more important to talk about, including um, the increased minimum wage to $12 an hour. He also... I'm uh, sorry, can I jump in there real quick? I was going to say, yeah. and everyone needs to know legislatively that uh, there is a 15 per hour bill or several of them as well. Yes, there are several bills increasing the minimum wage. The governor is putting um, his line in the sand at $12 an hour. There are several that would increase it to 15 and there are some sort of permutations on the $12 to $15 an hour um, rate uh, throughout the General Assembly. There are several bills that would do um, one or the other or some sort of combination of the two. Um, so we're keeping an eye on all of those. Um, next, the governor is proposing guaranteed sick leave for businesses with 25 or more employees. And the rate at which he's proposing is uh, an hour uh, for every 40 hours worked. The next item is a, he's calling a, a PA SMART program, which would align workforce development programs across agencies. He's proposing a number of initiatives to address workforce development, which I'll go into a little bit more in detail on the next slide, um, but to try to address the skills gap that we have in Pennsylvania. Um, funding to hire... And a lot of uh, our members have that problem. I know we've done some surveys and it's hard to find the right person for the job right now. Sure. And the governor has heard that too. He's um, last year had a task force, I believe it's several task force uh, meetings on this issue. So this is meant to address, address that particular issue. 
Um, there's a proposal uh, to for funding to hire 35 additional staff members at DEP um, because of complaints about not um, being able to get permits um, timely. So 35 more staff members at DEP to help with uh, customer service. Also, uh, the governor is proposing again to implement full combined reporting uh, to eliminate the Delaware loophole. Um, multi-state co corporations. And I also added uh, the governor's proposals to modernize the Equal Pay Law and the Human Relations Act um, because he specifically mentioned that he wants to address discriminatory pay and hiring and specifically the gender gap and um, would like to encourage victims of sexual misconduct to come forward without fear of negative consequences. So we don't have uh, details yet on what exactly uh, he's proposing, but I did want to mention those two. Um, as they, they might be of interest. Here are some of the key initiatives for your reference. Again, I'm not going to go into detail, but the second bullet here is the one that um, that's most of interest because education is a major focus of the governor's budget, and in particular, trying to address the workforce needs and the skills gap, as we talked about on the previous slide. So. Um, the education funding includes a million dollars for basic education, so that's K through 12. But there are also a number of programs um, emphasizing STEM, computer science, lots of emphasis on apprenticeships and industry partnerships, public-private sector partnerships, workforce training and development, and uh, various grant programs that emphasize workforce training um, and industry partnerships. So I have a whole list of them if anybody's interested in more detail um, and what exactly the funding is going into, um, I can provide that. But there is quite a bit of emphasis on workforce training and uh, apprenticeship programs um, and, and trying to address the skills gap in this budget. So here is um, how the state funding comes in and how it goes out. On the left-hand side, you can see how the state uh, funding is is, is uh, raised, and about three-quarters of it comes in through personal income taxes and sales and use taxes. I thought you might find that interesting. On the right-hand side is how it's spent, as proposed by the governor. And this slide just shows you sort of the right-hand side of the pie, um, how the, the funding is spent. And here you can really see, I like this chart a lot because you can really see the impact of the big three. Um, education, criminal justice, and health and human services take up 89% of the state budget. And if you add in debt service, that 3% in purple there down at the bottom, you get 92% of the state budget. So really that only leaves 8% of the state budget, which is uh, other programs. So you really do get an idea for how little of the state budget is really, you know, able to be spent on other items. And I guess Here's that's going to grow if education funding increases. Yes. Um, and I have a chart on education spending here on the next slide after this one. But this particular chart just shows the growth in state spending, spending over the years. The last bar would be the governor's proposed spending this year. So if you look over the past 10 years, um, it's about a 20% increase over the past 10 years in state spending. If the governor's budget this year is enacted as proposed. You can see last year um, was almost level funded. It was about a 500, is that right, about a $500 million increase. Okay, so to education. I could not find an update to this particular chart um, into the, the next two uh the next two budget years, but this is back um from uh twenty fifteen to sixteen and you can see it shows the increase in uh pre K through twelve state education funding. So it has been increasing um you know, the state funding for education has increased over the past 10 years. Um, this year, the governor's uh, proposing to spend, I think it's um, a total of about $600 million more, if I remember correctly. 
If you're wondering what the blue here is, those were um, those two years were actually stimulus funds that Governor Rendell put into education funding. So the state funds here are um, in green, and those state funds were backfilled those two years with federal stimulus funds. So you can see that the total of state the, the total education funding for those two years didn't drop. The state funds did, but in total with the federal funds, it remained consistent, actually higher. Okay, so this is just a slide that shows you where we rank on some um, common indicators. Um, state and local tax burden, we are the 15th highest um, in the nation. Economic outlook, we are 38th worst. And this one here on the right at the top is most worrisome, I think, with new business startups, we're 48th worst. So with regard to how the um, the economy is kind of picking up and starting to boom because of the federal tax cuts right now, our new business startups um, in Pennsylvania are still near the bottom. So we are not taking advantage here in Pennsylvania of those of um, that increased economic activity as much as other states. So I think what the combination of the um, statistics on this side shows is that we really need to improve our tax climate, our regulatory environment, and get a handle on our state budget, and especially our cost drivers. As you saw that chart um, with education, health and human services, and criminal justice spending take up such a large majority of our budget, and debt service for that matter. So I know you're interested in hearing about the minimum wage increase, so I, I have a whole slide here about that. So the governor's budget proposes this $12 increase to the minimum wage, and he is projecting that it would save about $100 million in welfare costs to the state. So those 100, that $100 million in savings for welfare costs is actually incorporated into his proposal for the state budget. I think it's likely that this doesn't account for increases in unemployment compensation and the tax lost due to the decline in the state's productivity. And you can see here from the top uh, bullet that uh, we actually had a research study done last year to estimate the impact of a $12 minimum wage increase. And NFIB estimates that this would actually lose a total of about 216,000 jobs over the next 10 years, with 57% of them being in small businesses. So the cumulative real reduction in state output could actually exceed $130 billion over the next 10 years. And that the impact of that on state tax revenue, um, we'd like to make sure that that's included in the consideration as people discuss this $12 per hour proposal. The fact is that, and everybody knows this, I'm sure, who's listening in, but the fact is that the minimum wage is really an entry level made wage. And you can see some of the statistics here we included. Um, it's meant to give a worker an avenue into the workforce to build skills. And as we've been talking about, job skills are critical, uh, a critical need in this economy. And the governor recognizes that in his proposal. So we're going to continue to emphasize that fact and we're going to continue to fight this, this increase. Yeah, usually you just hear about how people can't support children on the minimum wage, but that really in Pennsylvania is not so accurate because it's a very small percent there who have children. Yeah, if you look at the statistics, it's actually about, um, if I remember correctly, it's about 1% of minimum wage earners who are single, single um, parents. So here you go. You don't hear a lot about a lot from the uh, the folks who've lost their job because of the minimum wage hike, but they're they're certainly out there in uh, states and localities that have increased their minimum wage. Okay, a few other things we really needed to mention that are not directly tied to the budget, but these are administrative actions that have been proposed or have already been taken by the governor that will affect our members. Um, so we thought you should be aware of them. The first is this regulation that's been proposed by the Wolf administration that's going to increase the salary threshold for workers that will uh, to be paid overtime for more, working more than 40 hours a week. 
is he's actually proposed to more than double it from just over um, just under twenty four thousand to to just under forty eight thousand dollars by twenty twenty two. And then after that, there would be automatic updates every three years. So this proposal is almost exactly the same as a rule that was proposed by President Obama, which a federal court overturned as arbitrary and invalid just a couple of years ago. It's estimated to impact about a half a million workers in Pennsylvania. And I think um, you can expect legal action at the state level if the governor chooses to move forward with this. There's really nothing different between this and what what was proposed at the federal level. It's, and you can see the quote there below from our uh, staff, our senior staff attorney, Luke Wake, who who believes that it really is just as arbitrary and invalid as the federally, the federal proposed rule. Now, we had many, many people call from across the country with that Obama plan. So I'm assuming many people are affected here who might have new managers who are just getting into that role and aren't making a 47.8. And so we may be asking for some assistance, like a one push, you know, an alert for you to send a letter to your lawmaker. That would be great because those alerts really do make a, dif a difference. When I'm talking now, to I know that's regulatory. Will there be regulatory comment period, Rebecca? Yes, yes. All regulations have a comment period, and it is very helpful to us when we can get members who are involved in the comments. Um, they, uh, they in particular, really like to hear from people who are directly affected. It's one thing to hear from the the associations who represent. Um, represent people who are affected by regulations, but when they hear from the business owners themselves who are impacted by them, it's very, very, um, it's very helpful. So we'd be happy to get um, members who would be willing to provide comments. A couple of other outstanding issues here real quick that are at the top of our list. The first is uh, bonus depreciation. Uh, bonus depreciation. On the same day the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was signed in December, uh, the Department of Revenue actually published a tax bulletin, which disallowed bonus depreciation of capital investment at the state level. Um, the federal tax reform in Washington actually permits immediate 100% depreciation, which which has the goal of encouraging growth and investment. So Pennsylvania now is the only state to fully disallow bonus depreciation. This really puts our state at a big dis disadvantage when we're trying to attract businesses to invest here, in the, especially in the wake of these federal tax reforms. So uh, this is something we really want to address and try to get this reversed. There is a House bill, House Bill uh, 2017, that would reverse this. So we'd really like to work here this spring in trying to get that passed and, and get this reversed. So Pennsylvania is not at such a competitive disadvantage in trying to attract investment here. The other item, uh, I, I already mentioned it, passed with last year's budget, this non-resident withholding provision uh, that requires PA businesses to con to uh, collect tax on behalf of out-of-state contractors. There's also a bill that would reverse this, and there's also potential legal action. Um, it could be uh, challenged on an interstate commerce basis, so we're also looking into that. Okay, so that's uh, that's an overview of the state budget and some of the other related issues that we're tracking right now. So as Suzanne mentioned, as always, your voice makes a big difference. Um, when I am talking to legislators in the Capitol, I frequently hear that the most, the biggest thing, the most important thing that we can do is to bring the voices of our members um, directly to them. Because like I said, they, they like to hear from us as an association because we do bring a strong voice. Um, NFIB is, is well respected in the capital as a voice for small business, but they, they also love to hear directly from their businesses and their districts because it really does emphasize um, how important these issues are. Now, Rebecca, let so, me just quickly ask as you're going on down here to wrap it up. If anyone has any questions, please type them in now. Otherwise, we're more than happy to provide them um, and get a pen and you can write down the email. So sorry about that. Proceed, Rebecca. Sure. This note you have about uh, invite lawmakers to your business, that's interesting. Can you mention uh, what that's all about? 
Sure. Um, we we have events and um, we have events, and we also uh, would always, you know, encourage our members to uh, invite lawmakers to come tour your business. Um, the closer the the uh, the lawmaker can get to um, the actual business to see how what it takes to run a business and how you can um, or how you actually you know, manage your business and what it takes to run a small business, um, I think is, is really important because they can actually look and see how the policies that they are promoting or discussing in the capital impact your business on a daily basis. So for you to show them and then also to um, explain to them how the, the issues that they're discussing up in the capital impact your business on a day-to-day basis, for instance, the minimum wage or bonus depreciation. Maybe you want to make an investment in, in capital expenditures, but you don't feel as though you can do that because you can't you can't make that work with your taxes. Um, you can explain that to them on the on you know on the site and and really emphasize how important it is to your business. I think that's really helpful. Now, somebody is asking a question and they're wondering if we're going to send an email form that they can send to lawmakers about the minimum wage and depreciation issues. And what I'd like to say about that is we will absolutely be doing alerts on some of these issues. And one of the key things is to do it in a timely fashion so that lawmakers are focused on that issue. And then if you'll notice in your email, you'll see something that says alert and uh, Rebecca will figure out the best timing so that they get it, uh, you know, at the right time before a vote. So we will absolutely be doing that on any issue that we feel it's worth it. And this is another question, Rebecca, probably more Mm -hmm. of a federal question, but has the reduction in federal tax for employees also reduced business federal taxes? And um, that's a little confusing of a question, but I do have a sheet that delineates everything in the federal tax law. But as Rebecca had mentioned, there is full expensing. And what the governor is doing to uh, counterbalance that really does not allow for that and has some other changes where you can't even get the expensing till you sell the item. So um, if you want, I could answer that one offline and send you an email. And I'm more than happy to give everybody a copy of our breakdown of the federal law. Let's just see if we have any other questions here. No, that looks to be about it. So listen, thank you all so much. Did you want to add anything else, Rebecca, before we close it out? No, I'll I'll just mention that if anybody, you know, thinks of another question later, um, both of our email addresses are on the presentation. Um, So please contact me with any questions about any legislative issues or the budget. Why don't you move to the move to that slide that has your email there? There There we go. Um, And the other thing I was going to say, too, is I will be posting these slides on our web page with the audio in the next day or two. Uh, Let's see here if we have another question. Let's just check. Oh, thank you. (laughs) That was nice. We got to appreciate all you're doing. Well, we appreciate all you guys are doing, and we love to hear from you if you have any issues at any time. So thank you so much, and we shall join you next month. You'll be getting an email about what we'll be doing in March very soon. Thank you very much, and thank you, Rebecca. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.